Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 770, Psychological Testing and Assessment. And I'm beginning uh, today with another great web comic from the great web comic series PhDcomics.com, which you should totally check out, especially if you're a graduate student in the sciences. And this one, as you can see, provides a useful table for deciding whether or not to refer to yourself as a student or a researcher. Uh, something that um, I can certainly remember facing that decision in various points of my career and I think there's a bit of humor here that we can all appreciate. Okay, so today's lecture is called Estimating Reliability. The last lecture, uh, the one that preceded it of course, talked about reliability in um, rather conceptual terms and in this lecture I want to get more specific and talk about the ways in which we can come up with numbers to represent the reliability of a particular test. And once we've done that, what we can do with those numbers. So by, by way of an overview, I'll do a quick review from the last lecture because the last lecture was fairly dense. I'll talk about some different ways to estimate reliability. And then I'll talk about some ways of interpreting or using these reliability coefficients or reliability estimates. Now I'll warn you right now, this lecture is rather long as I was sort of editing and compiling it, it just was easy to add more and more slides. I did my best to keep things um, as brief as possible and also as clear as possible, but by the end I could see this is one of the longer lectures I've done in this class or indeed I think in any class. So I beg your patience right now and uh, you know, if you need to take a break at some point during this video, you know, pause, get a cup of coffee, get yourself a drink, um, I'm, I will understand. So here's the review from last time. If we're thinking about reliability, we're thinking about some related concepts, concepts like error, reliability, error, inconsistency. And the way to kind of put these together is to say that tests which have less error associated with them are more reliable or they are more consistent. And I think that kind of makes sense at a fairly uh, intuitive level, but if we want to think about it in terms of our conceptual equation of observed score, equals true score plus error from classical test theory. Um, we can see that uh, if we have tests which have large amounts of error associated, associated with them, that takes um, the value of the true score away from the value of the observed score. Or maybe more, more precisely, we can say the one side of the equation uh, gets different from the other side of the equation as a function of how much error there is. And we can see that if we use the conceptual equation or if we substitute in variances for these observed scores, true scores, and error scores. That's if we're just thinking about what reliability is and how it works. If we're trying to estimate uh, reliability, we can use a couple different methods. One way to estimate reliability is to express the ratio of the variances between the true and the observed scores, or one minus the ratio of the variances of the error and the observed scores. And I talked about this last time, but to summarize in a quick review, this is kind of like asking what portion of the observed score is true score? Or equivalently, what portion of the observed score is not error score? And I think that makes sense. Another way to estimate reliability is to look at the squared correlation between the observed score and the true score, or to look at one minus the squared correlation between the observed score and the error scores. And, and I think this makes uh, some sense too. It's like asking the question, uh, how closely associated are the true score and the observed score, or how not closely associated are the observed score and the error score? Of course, the problem that we noted in the last lecture was that this, uh, these examples that I've given uh, right just now and I gave in the last lecture depend upon knowing things that we don't know. We don't know true scores of people. We only have observed scores and thus we, we don't know what a, an individual person's true score is and we can't compute what an individual person's error score is. So how can we use any of this information to estimate reliability? So last time I introduced from classical test theory the idea of parallel tests. Parallel tests are just two tests which have a special relationship with each other. That special relationship is defined by some important assumptions. And one assumption is that the true scores 
that one test uh, uh, can measure are, equi are equivalent for a group of folks to the true scores that the other test will measure. So however those tests are constructed or whatever they look like, they are measuring the same construct in, you know, at exactly the same level in your group of people. Um, and relatedly, the tests have the same level of error associated with them. So one test is no more error prone in its measurements than is the other test. If you could imagine a situation where this is true, where these assumptions hold, then you'd have a situation of two parallel tests, or indeed of more than two parallel tests. So again, you can think about parallel tests as giving us a way to look at consistency, lack of error, um, across different types of tests. And those tests that are parallel to each other could be alternate forms of a test, you know, version A, version B of the test. They could be the same test given at different times, like a test retest. They could be the same test given by different administrators or raters, or they could even be different portions of one test. So odd items on the test versus even items, or one mixture of items versus another mixture of items. In any of these ways, we could in principle construct or, or create parallel testing situations. And if we could do that, then we could just look at the relationship between those two parallel tests. So the point of this, or the reason why I'm bringing this up, is these different types of reliability estimates, uh, these different types of parallel tests give us different types of reliability estimates. Some of these I'm sure you've already heard before, things like test retest reliability you've almost certainly encountered in other classes, inter-rater reliability you may have heard of if you've taken you know, developmental or educational psychology classes, and you've probably heard of things like split half reliability or coefficient alpha and so on. The connection I guess I'm trying to make right now is that these are ways of evaluating two or more tests, um, comparing them to each other, and if we can make certain assumptions that kind of trace back to parallel testing and classical test theory, then our estimates of reliability from these methods are, are useful or informative. And as we'll see, you know, to the extent that we can't make those assumptions or we're uncertain about those assumptions, those same estimates of reliability may be uh, unuseful or, or at least problematic. And, and as a general point, I'll, I'll just quickly observe here that in most cases of what we're talking about, our comparison of these two you know, allegedly parallel tests will take the form of a simple correlation coefficient. Now that's not true for every form of reliability that I'm going to mention, but it's true for several of them. And the reason why I'm mentioning this now is, of course, you've heard of correlation coefficients and you know uh, that these are ways of, or a correlation coefficient is a way of expressing the linear relationship between two sets of scores. So if you have, let's say on the x-axis, scores for test version A, on the y-axis scores for test version B, or pretest versus post-test, or even items versus odd items, or Raider 1 versus Raider 2. In any of these examples, you can imagine making correlations that would express the relationship or the consistency across the alternate forms of the testing. And to the extent that that correlation was very high, approaching 1, um, you would say, oh, this test is quite reliable. To the extent that it's rather low or lingering around zero, you'd say this test is probably not very reliable. It's not very consistent. A couple important points from last time. It's really, I think, key to remember that estimates of reliability or even just general kind of conceptual discussions of reliability are, are not absolute in nature. There is no um, one way of expressing reliability. There's no one way of estimating reliability. Um, what we often have to do when we discuss reliability or when we try and estimate is consider the context of that discussion or that estimation. What type of flavor of reliability are we talking about? What type of use are we considering where reliability information may be important? The other thing we have to keep in mind is that reliability is not some fixed property of a uh, of, of a test like you know the the atomic number of a particular element in the periodic table rather it's this value that varies probably across a continuum from highly inconsistent to highly consistent 
given the context in which we are talking about reliability. So we might say this test when used in this particular population or when used in this particular way is quite consistent, it's quite reliable. However, if we use it in some other way or with some different population or under different sets of circumstances for testing, we may expect or worry that our test is highly inconsistent or highly unreliable. So that's, that's just important and obviously I mentioned that last time, but this is review. The other point that's important that um, I didn't so much talk about last time, but I will try and talk about this time, is that all of these estimates of reliability that I'm about to roll out all depend on various assumptions and issues. And as I kind of hinted already, um, when these assumptions are met or when we can feel fairly confident in the, um, the correctness of these assumptions, then our estimates of reliability can be useful to us or informative. But when they aren't, they aren't. And that's really important to think about because like all calculations that we make, especially in the sciences, especially in the social sciences, behavioral sciences, um, we can, things can be wrong, things can be incorrect, and we need to get away from thinking in sort of very overly concrete, overly absolute terms about our calculations, in this case about our estimates of reliability. Okay, so the first way I want to think about reliability is I'm calling it test consistency, meaning the consistency across two different versions of a test. And of course, here I'm referring to this idea of alternate forms reliability, which is simply have or make two versions of the test which are not identical to each other. They don't have exactly the same items or problems or puzzles on them, but they are identical in the sense of measuring the same construct to the same level of accuracy and with the same relative lack of error. And then once you've done that, you just compute the correlation uh, between the scores that a group of people have on version A of the test and version B. And that's your estimate of reliability, your alternate forms reliability. Of course, it's not quite that simple because you have to ask yourself, how comparable are these forms? Well, you know, if you were doing this, and I've distantly in the past, I can remember doing this in an undergraduate psychology laboratory that I worked in when I was at school. Um, I remember coming up with alternate versions of a particular test of personality, and we had to go through item by item on our first test and try and find matched items which had very similar content and seemed to have similar basic statistical properties in terms of you know their mean within our samples, our our you know, standard deviation with our samples, and we would sort of match on t version A of the test each item to an item which could be the its representative or its corresponding item on version B. And it was an incredibly labor-intensive process. It was interesting, sort of. You know, can you kind of have debates like, does this item, does this question equal this other question? And if it does, can we match it on version B of our test? And the problem I found, and I'm sure everyone else who does this finds, is it's just really hard to be sure. You can come up with two sets of items which seem pretty similar to you as the test maker, but you can never be entirely certain that they represent entirely uh, parallel ways of measuring the same construct. So of course, once you have your two uh, parallel versions of the test, and you can administer them to a group of people, um, you're probably going to find that the scores differ between those two tests. So it might be the case that you know, if you look at the averages across both um, sets of te both tests for your sample of people, or if you look at individual test taker scores on version A and version B, you'd see that they're not entirely lining up perfectly. To the extent that this um, lack of consistency is random across our test takers, then this is probably just giving us an indication or sort of an example of unsystematic error in measurement, which is problematic. You know, to the extent that a measurement uh, has unsystematic error associated with it, lots of calculations we make with that measurement, including calculations or estimates of reliability, will tend to be incorrect or inaccurate. So if you had version A of the test, version B of the test, you notice that the means for the two tests in your sample are not the same, or you just scan down the columns of numbers and you see that across different test takers, you know, people aren't getting exactly the same score on version A and version B. To the extent that you s suppose that that's unsystematic, it's a problem. To the extent that it's non-random across test takers, that's a bigger problem because that's systematic error in measurement or potentially biased 
measurement or measurement bias. Um, you could have a situation in which, unbeknownst to you, maybe your alternate forms are really different forms. They're measuring different things. Your, your test, you started with a test of anxiety and you tried to come up with an alternate form of it so you could evaluate the reliability of your test, but your alternate form maybe involved or was contaminated with lots of items that had to do with depression, which are similar to those related to anxiety, but they're a little bit different. Or maybe your alternate form has items which are more heavily endorsed by females as compared to males or people of a particular ethnic group as compared to people of another ethnic group. And now your tests are not measuring the same construct the same way. They're measuring the same construct and maybe some other constructs. And you wouldn't necessarily know that, uh, but you might worry about that and worry that you're not just uh, challenging or, or your measurements of est or your estimates of reliability, but also even um, challenging the very validity of the alternate version of the test that you've come up with. So, At the risk of belaboring this point too much further, I, I will highlight a couple other assumptions and issues that come up in alternate form testing, which are really come up in other forms of, of testing for reliability as well. Um, as I said already, the, the basic idea here is that our two alternate versions, our two tests, should really measure the same construct. And what we mean by that in more formal terms that come from classical test theory is that the true scores on one test should be equal to the true scores on the other test. And of course we can't know this because we don't see true scores, we only see observed scores, but in principle that's what should be true for a test or a pair of tests to be uh, technically parallel to each other. Um, now, in, this is in principle impossible to know, of course, like I just said. In practice, this assumption uh, you know, almost can't be true because each test is a different sample of items. You know, in, um, in previous lectures, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this idea of sampling, and we often think of sampling from a population of participants or test takers, and we have our sample of college students, and they're hopefully representative of the broader population of college students. That same notion of sampling can be applied to items on a test. So there is some population of items that could be on your test, whether your original form or your alternate form, and you are in some way or another sampling from that, that population or that universe of content. Now, if you're making alternate forms, you're necessarily drawing different samples of items. You don't want to repeat items in version A and version B. You want them to be different, but somehow measuring the same thing. And because they're different, they're almost always going to be, um, at least in some at principle level, some uh, violation of this idea that we're measuring exactly the same thing exactly the same way. A related idea that comes up in alternate forms testing for reliability and comes up in other forms of testing for reliability as well is that there shouldn't be any sort of carryover effect between the two tests. So for instance, um, you could imagine you've got version A and version B of your test and you bring a sample of people into your laboratory and administer them and maybe if you're quite conscientious you might randomly uh, order the tests so that some people in your sample get version B first and then they get version A and other people get version A first and then they get version B and that would be a good idea. But you nonetheless hope that doing one test doesn't influence how you do the second test, whichever order you get. Um, and the reason for that, and this goes back to classical test theory, is that we assume with any test that the errors associated with responses on that test are unsystematic, or put another way, random. You know, the uh, on any individual, um, you know, my my score on the test or your score on the test, um, you know, the observed score is some amount of uh, is you know has some error associated with it. That error shouldn't be correlated with anything else, it should be random. And, and in particular, the errors from one test shouldn't or can't correlate with errors from another test. And in a practical sense, this may be true or this may not be true. Um, it's again, impossible for us to know because we don't directly observe uh, true scores and we don't directly observe error scores. But we can imagine a situation in which the errors associated with one test uh, would not be uh, uncorrelated with the errors associated with another test. You know, perhaps um, 
you know, doing the first test makes you more thoughtful about whatever the thing is that's being measured. It's some element of personality or emotion. And thus on the second test, you are in some way more accurate or less error prone in your responding. Or it, you know, might, a simpler example would be something like if you were developing alternate forms of a memory test or a, a test of achievement or a test of something where there's some practice effects going on, doing the first test maybe makes you a little bit better at doing the second test. And now your errors are not, uh, un, or your errors are not uncorrelated on both of these tests. So this is an, an issue in a, that comes up and it's problematic for alternate forms testing and indeed for some other forms of testing that we use for reliability and it's worth thinking about. So as you're thinking about this you might say oh, okay okay I'm I'm coming up with these alternate forms of my test but what if they're just close enough I mean I can't know what people's true scores are I can't know what their error scores are I'm gonna do my best to match items and I'm not trying to cheat or anything I come up with two versions that seem alternate to me they seem parallel to me let's let's see how this works um, okay good good for you um, like I said I did this once when I was an undergrad or at least I was part of a research group that did this and it, it's kind of interesting um, let's walk through an example um, of how this might look in terms of estimating reliability um, with the um, with the sort of forewarning or the note note that in this example um, unlike in real life we're gonna pretend we know people's true scores and thus can compute things like their error scores. And that's not something we would know in real life, but we can in this silly example. So here's just a little bit of data that I obviously put into Excel. We have a very small sample of people, just six students, and we've got two versions of our test, version one and version two. And we can see for each test, there are some observed scores. And because we are uh, omniscient somehow, we know each person's true score, which should be the same uh, for both tests and in fact it is the same for both tests and you can see that if I compute the reliability of test one uh, using any of the ways I described last time and I compute the reliability of test two doing any of the ways I observed last time um, I get the same reliability so this is an ideal situation or you know, we'll see an almost ideal situation in which it really looks like these two tests are pretty damn parallel to one another. And to continue that point or to highlight that point even further, we could compute the correlation between the true scores uh, measured with each of these tests. And we can see, of course, it's 100 or you know, it's perfect. It's a perfect one because, of course, the true scores for each person on each test are exactly the same. So this is that seemingly perfect situation. Well, it's not quite so perfect because the correlations of the error scores are also uh, quite high. They're not zero, which we would hope. And then, you know, to satisfy the issues and assumptions of alternate forms testing, we'd want the correlation between the errors on test one and the errors on test two to be zero, or at least very small. And in this case, it's quite high. And we can also see if we compute the correlation between our two alternate forms, it's pretty high and quite different from the reliability of either the original or the alternate form of the test. So just to be clear, what we're doing here is imagine for the moment that we didn't know the true scores and error scores for each of our tests. We had, as would be the case in real life, just the observed scores for test one and the observed score for test two. And we compared the correlation between those two um, observed scores. We would get a correlation coefficient of 0.96 and we'd say, wow, you know, these alternate forms are really similar. The reliability of this test is really high. But in reality, the reliability that we've estimated is a fair overestimate of the real reliability of the original version of the test, or indeed the alternate version, which is at about you know, 0.4. So problem because, or at least related to the fact that we have correlated error terms uh, for these two tests. So important points here, alternate forms, uh, ways of estimating reliability can 
overestimate actual reliability. Um, not always, but they can. Um, and the, the general idea here is that the correlation between errors makes the correlation between observed scores seem higher than in a sense it should be. Um, and the problem is worse in small samples. Um, psychometric properties should always be evaluated in large samples, just like any other research question, really. I mean, it's only a few instances that I can think of where small samples are appropriate. Um, and in this uh, sort of silly example that I made up, we only had six people. So any problems with estimating reliability are only just going to be much, much worse. You could imagine if I had, instead of six people, 600 people, it's likely that those that, that correlation between the errors on test version one and the errors on test version two would be quite a lot smaller. And to the extent that the correlation is smaller, we might expect the estimate of the reliability of the two tests to be closer to the actual or real reliability of the original form of the test. So you may be thinking, okay, can I do alternate form reliability? You've, you sort of shot the whole thing down. Um, well, maybe you can do it. And as I said before, I did it, or I was among a group of people who did it. Um, you can do it if you're really confident that the tests that you're making are parallel to each other. And as I kind of hinted before, or more than hinted, I suppose, it is no exact way of knowing this. It involves a lot of very careful work as you think about the individual items on your original version of the test and try and come up with good matches. Uh, in terms of content and kind of uh, sort of basic descriptive statistics for your alternate test. Um, so you can do this, uh, but it takes a lot of work and you're probably never entirely com comfortable or confident. And you also have to remember that your reliability calculation can ultimately be a bit of an overestimate, especially in small samples, but you should kind of already know that small samples are a bad thing. Um, as I noted already, this is a costly and difficult process. In a sense, it doubles the cost of making a test. So all the effort and time and money that you put into uh, you know, developing that original version of the test, well, multiply it by two because now you're making this alternate version of the test. And unsurprisingly, I suppose, very few test developers come up with alternate versions of their tests because it's very difficult to do. Uh, maybe an exception to that would be neuropsychological testing. There are some examples, you know, the, the R bands test, which is one of the ones we're going to talk about in this class, is an example of a a test which has alternate forms and that's useful because uh, in neuropsych testing you often want to do repeated testing over time. Um, you know, testing you know, someone with dementia one day and then testing them six months later uh, or, or even not quite so long later and it's nice to have alternate forms that are exactly identical so as to minimize hopefully the effect of practice. You're not seeing the same memory items that you saw last time you took the test and thus you don't get a bit of a help or maybe an artificial boost the second time you take it as compared to the first time. So alternate form testing can be done and it is done, it's just kind of challenging. So let's move on and think about reliability and estimate reliability in a slightly different way. And this is reliability as temporal consistency. Here, of course, I'm just talking about test retest reliability, which is kind of like alternate forms reliability. We're administering two tests. They just happen to be the same test separated by some amount of time. It could be a very short amount of time. It could be a very long amount of time. In fact, if you're doing test retest reliability calculations, a big question is how much time? You know, if I want to evaluate the test retest reliability of my, you know, measure of emotionality, um, should I wait an hour? Or should I wait a day, a week, a year? Um, of course, it depends a lot on the construct that we're talking about, and your hopefully well-informed theory as to how flexible or changeable that construct is. You know, clearly, there are some things about. Um, individual mental functioning that seem relatively stable, you know, probably some aspects of intellectual ability, probably some aspects of memory, at least during the prime years of your life. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe some aspects of temperament or personality. There are probably a lot of other things in psychology uh, that change quite a lot or quite frequently or even in hard to predict in idiosyncratic ways. So it depends on what you're studying, of course, and it depends on the type of test. You know, what is the nature of the test? How do the items work? Is uh, it the case or is it likely the case that familiarity or practice will influence scores? So if, for instance, a memory test, if you administer the same memory test repeatedly with the same items, it's very likely that 
as the person who or the people who are taking the test take it again and again they're going to get better just because they're starting to recognize these items carried over or practiced over from their previous chances to take the test the challenge here of course is that scores can change over time you know, if you test and then retest scores can change over time and that could have to do with some sort of underlying change in the construct or it could have to do with some aspect of any of the things that we might call measurement errors things like improvement practice maturation treatment you know, you're measuring someone's level of, of depression and you know over to, or I shouldn't say someone a group of people's level of depression with your test of depression and over time you know some of those folks are probably just going to get better uh, on their own or maybe some of those folks are in treatment so they're getting better uh, maybe there are practice effects obviously over some intervals of time people could get worse because of things like fatigue or boredom or degeneration which is just kind of a, a fussy way of saying people get worse for some things over time like you could imagine trying to evaluate the reliability of a test of memory in a using a sample of senior citizens um, and you might see that over time memory scores change and in fact get worse just because people's memory is declining because all the people in your sample are aging just to kind of give a funny illustration of this um, here is a, a scatter plot of course for the relationship between um, a finger tapping speed task that is literally how fast can you tap your finger on a you know little wood a piece of wood on a table um, or, or like a little um, sort of old-timey telegraph tapper and you can see there's the first trial and the second trial and I forget exactly how how closely um, or how closely or farly spaced these titles are but let's just assume there's some amount of time elapses between them and you would probably think that someone's finger tapping wouldn't change that much that would be some kind of very low level kind of psychomotor function that really should be pretty solid and you can see there is a pretty high correlation I guess you can sort of guess given the nature of the cloud of dots there's a high correlation between how fast people are on their first trial and how fast they are on their second trial but it's by no means a perfect correlation so even something as simple seemingly as that does change over time and or at least the scores change now whether that's because people's psychomotor functioning is changing or whether it's because there's some kind of practice effect where you get a little faster the second time you have to tap your finger I don't know but we observe that in all sorts of things in psychology even things which seem like they ought to be probably pretty stable and you know to kind of further sort of drill down on this point let's note that in some cases scores could change over time equally for all test takers this seems unlikely but you could imagine that you had a sample of people who you gave a test to and then you gave them a test again and they the scores changed equally for every single person everyone went down by an equal amount or everyone went up by an equal amount this wouldn't actually be a problem uh, because the variability of scores across those two intervals wouldn't change um, what's more likely of course is that the scores will change um, and they'll change randomly maybe for test takers this would be unsystematic measurement error some people go up some people don't go down we don't have any good reason of explaining why that is the test just isn't consistent over time now, this is a problem in the sense that it hampers our ability to estimate reliability <clears throat> we are worried that our estimate of reliability is not going to be very accurate because the scores changed a lot and we don't particularly know why it would be worse if we had non-random changes for test takers systematic measure um, errors of measurement uh, this could be a situation where people at the high end of scores on the first time tend to improve more at the second time point than do people at the low end of scores a so-called rich get richer effect or there could be differential treatment response if we're thinking about like testing and retesting uh, over the course of a treatment interval where people are you know getting medication or getting psychotherapy if there's some reason why some group of folks improve more than another group of folks and it's a sort of a definable group difference then that would be systematic measurement error and it could be a really big problem for interpreting any sort of reliability estimate from your test so hopefully you can see that there are some issues or problems that are somewhat particular uh, to um, to test retest reliability um, 
there are also some assumptions and issues that are in many ways very similar to alternate forms reliability and that of course sort of harken back to classical test theory. In a sense of course we want to imagine or assume that the uh, tests you know, the tests at the pretest interval and the same test at the post-test interval at the second time are parallel to each other, meaning that they measure the true score of each individual exactly the same at those two time points. Um, and in a practical sense, this may be true, it, it may not be true. Again, this goes back a lot to our understanding of how stable or unstable the construct uh, is. You know, if this is something which changes quite a lot, it's some aspect of mood or, or kind of kind of interest or inclination, it might be very hard to argue that we can measure good test free test reliability because the thing we're measuring is we would just expect to be changing a lot over time. And I know I already talked about carryover or practice effects. Um, they are in some ways particular uh, to um, test tree test reliability for the obvious reasons, I suppose. But they're also similar to how we talk about carryover effects for alternate forms testing. The basic idea is um, we would hope or we would assume that the errors uh, at one test point, you know, the first administration, are unrelated to the errors at the second type or the second administration. Um, there, you know, this may be true, this, this may not be true. It really depends. And uh, we certainly can acknowledge that there could be reasons why some test takers could get better, get better or get worse with time in a way that doesn't have to do with the underlying changing of their construct. So you may be thinking to yourself, oh, you know, you've trashed alternate forms reliability, now you're trashing test free test reliability, can I please use this? I'd say, well, of course, maybe you can. And, you know, for what this is worth, way back in undergrad in the psych lab that I worked in, <clears throat> we did a couple studies where we looked at the test tree test reliability of the same instrument that we were at the time developing. It's funny, I think back on those times, I learned a lot, I think, about basic psychometrics without really even getting a formal introduction to the, the, the field. I just was in a lab and we were developing a new questionnaire to measure an aspect of emotions and we went through things like alternate forms testing and test retest testing and so on. Anyway, so with test retest reliability, if you're confident that the construct you're measuring is fairly stable and if you're confident that the test is parallel with itself over time, then in principle, of course, you could do test retest reliability. And you also have to be, um, you know, or, or you put this another way, you have to just be able to assume that the construct and the test have this sort of stability or consistency. And at the risk of repeating myself, I just say the important points here are that test retest reliability is a lot like alternative forms reliability. Um, the idea behind test retest, at least in some ways, is to reduce uncertainty about content. You know, remember with alternate forms testing, a big problem you had is this uncertainty as to whether the content, the items on version two or version B, are really parallel to the items on version uh, one or version A. You, get, you can do away with that uncertainty by saying, well, we'll just use the same test twice. Well, now the content is the same. Um, so you've removed some of that uncertainty, but you still have some of the same assumptions about um, you know, a true score measurement and error measurement. Um, <clears throat> and you also have some additional assumptions about the stability of the construct over time. And that depends a lot on the nature of the construct and the amount of time <clears throat> Pardon me, the amount of time that you're allowing to elapse between measurement. Now, bottom line, these are tricky assumptions to make in psychology. A lot of the stuff that we study, we expect is changeable. So you could make this argument that test tree test reliability estimates are going to be really hard to interpret. How do we know really what a low test tree test correlation means? Does that mean that the construct changed a lot during that interval? Or does it just mean that performance on the test, i.e. measurement error, was a big problem across that interval? What, do we, what does a high correlation mean? So we, we sometimes hesitate to interpret test retest reliability, but I think we're all kind of curious about it because again, we're, we're in psychology, we like to study things that change over time. Most of the stuff we care about or are interested in uh, is stuff which we think changes. And that's what's fun about psychology. So 
It's history test reliability, I guess in the way I have this sort of soft spot in my heart for, because it's this kind of problematic way of thinking about reliability that is nonetheless, to me at least, a very, very interesting thing to think about. It's something that I think we're all kind of curious on or curious about. Okay, so we've thought about reliability in terms of the consistency across alternate forms of a test or the consistency of a test across time. Now there are a way of think there are a host of ways of thinking about reliability in terms of internal consistency. So one way of thinking about reliability is internal consistency is split half reliability. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with this from other classes you've taken. This is the idea of you administer the test once, you divide the items in half, maybe odds versus evens, or front side of the page versus back side of the page, or whatever. You just come, or even randomly, you just come up with two uh, equal um, groups of items, compute scores for each sub, you know, subgroup or group of items, and then look at the correlation between the two of them. Um, it's funny, in doing this little talk, I'm thinking back to my undergrad. I'm getting nostalgic because, again, in this lab, uh, we did alternate forms reliability, test retest reliability. I remember doing split half reliability. Um, it's often done as a supplement for test retest reliability, frankly, just because it's easy to do. It only involves one administration of the test, and you've already got the data, so why not? Um, it's worth noting, though, that the reliability estimates for split half reliability tend to be a little bit higher than those for test retest reliability. If you think about this for a second, you can probably come up with some good reasons why. In the case of test retest reliability, there's likely going to be some um, uh, loss of consistency either associated with change in the construct over time or associated with measurement error because of the passage of time. Maybe it's something like a practice effect that makes people's scores differ uh, from the, you know, on the second testing than on the first testing. So those things will tend to drive down estimates of reliability. Um, in the case of split half reliability, you don't have those things because it's just one testing interval. You also only have half the items on each of your sub tests, you know, each of the groups that you formed from your original set of items. And smaller numbers of items uh, tend to have higher, you know, less stable and often higher correlations than larger numbers of items. And you may already know that, or you may have seen that in other classes, but if, if you haven't, just think back to the beginning of this lecture when I gave my little somewhat silly example of doing alternate forms of reliability with only six people. Imagine that instead of six people, those were six items on a particular test. Um, the more items we have, uh, or, you know, the more stable our estimates of reliability will be for that test. The fewer items, the less stable. You know, in the worst possible cases, we could have like a single item measure, which just has one item. The reliability of that might be rather unstable. It's going to change a lot person to person or time to time. Anyway, how do we select the items for uh, split half reliability? Well, um, Again, uh, you know, you could do it randomly, you could do odds or evens. This maybe is a good choice if you're doing some sort of a test of achievement or a test of ability where there are right and wrong answers and where maybe especially the items get harder as the test goes on. Um, there are probably all sorts of different ways. As I mentioned already, reliability is influenced, or estimates of reliability, I should say, are influenced by test length. Shorter tests are just less reliable than longer tests, and splitting produces shorter alternate forms. I mean, essentially, you're making alternate forms of your test, um, but they're shorter than your original form of the test, and this can underestimate the reliability of the full test. Um, there's a way of compensating for this or offsetting for this. It's the Spearman-Brown formula that is an adjustment for uh, split half reliability. That's designed to kind of offset the the loss of reliability associated with doing a split half. An interesting thing to notice, and, and I, in fact I noticed this way back when I was an undergrad, is that you can do different ways of splitting half of your test, whether it's odd or even, 
or one random solution versus another random solution, and each time you get slightly different split half correlations. So that's it's not really weird, but at the time I remember, you know, like 18, 19 years old, being like, whoa, that's weird. Which one's the real split half reliability? Well, in a sense, they're all spl the real split half reliability. Uh, and in fact, if you wanted to, you could sort of average them all together. There is a technique for doing this that was developed by Lee Kronbach, and it's a quick sidebar, I'll just note he's an educational psychologist who's very, very influential in the development of statistics and psychometrics, and among his other contributions, developed a uh, calculation he called coefficient alpha, or which is sometimes known to us as Kronbach alpha. And Kronbach alpha looks like this. Now, we don't need to um, you know, memorize this formula. I won't test you on a, on a, uh, on a test, but basically um, what we're doing here is taking the number of items on the test and we're including that number in a calculation with the variances of all the items on the test and the variances of the total scores. And by putting these together we get a final calculation which is going to give us a sense of the internal consistency of the test. And you've certainly encountered coefficient alpha or Chromebox alpha before. It's an easy calculation to make, or at least it's easy to get SPSS to do it for you. And so you'll often read like the method section of a paper and they'll say, we use the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. It was reliable, alpha equals blah, blah, blah. That's coefficient alpha. As a side point, I'd say I never liked that type of writing because it, it implies that there is one calculation of reliability and that Chromebox Alpha is the way to do it and that that one estimate is the right answer. Um, but anyway, you often see that. Um, there are some myths about coefficient alpha or some misunderstandings that I think are worth mentioning and here are a few of them on the next couple of slides. One is that coefficient alpha Chromebox Alpha, I'll probably flip back and forth between those two, is a fixed property of a test. Like the reliability of a particular scale is 0.8 or 0.7 or, or whatever else. The reality is it depends on the sample, like all estimates of reliability. Um, so, you know, it's tempting, as I said before, to think about reliability as this highly fixed property of a test. It really isn't. It's variable with context and with application. Another uh, myth about coefficient alpha, though you see this less and less in the literature, you used to see this a lot, I can remember seeing it as an undergrad, is that high values mean the test is unidimensional. So if you have a, a test that has a high coefficient alpha, you conclude or you argue that what that means is that the test is measuring one single underlying factor or dimension of whatever it is, you know, depression or, or, or alexithymia or mindfulness. Um, that's just not true. Um, coefficient alpha tends to increase with the number of items on a test. Um, tests with multiple dimensions can have high coefficient alpha if each uh, dimension, if the items on each dimension are sufficiently numerous. Um, and generally speaking, you really shouldn't do coefficient alpha with tests which are multidimensional. Like, you know, if you had a test which was designed to measure multiple uh, fairly distinct or independent factors or dimensions, you wouldn't want to just squish it all into a coefficient alpha calculation because it doesn't really make sense. You don't care about the overall internal consistency of something which has multiple distinct parts to it. But sometimes people do it, or at least they used to do it, and uh, you know, you, you would every so often see this argument made, like coefficient alpha was 0.8, suggesting that this is a unidimensional scale. It's like, nope, it, it's not. That's just a misunderstanding. Another kind of myth about coefficient alpha is that just bigger is better. I mean, generally speaking, of course, in, in, in psychometrics, larger estimates of reliability seem better than small estimates of reliability. That's certainly true for alternate forms and test retest and split half. In the case of coefficient alpha, this is true as well, but up to a point. Um, having a high, uh, very high coefficient alpha may mean that the test is just asking the same question too many different ways. You know, kind of like I said before, you can increase coefficient alpha for your test just by increasing the number of items on it. So if you asked all your questions and then asked another set of questions, they're kind of the same but slightly reworded, and then asked even more questions, as you bump up the number of questions that are sort of measuring the same thing in slightly different ways, you're going to tend to increase coefficient alpha. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something to keep in mind. Like if you had a test with a hundred items on it and you're very proud of your very high coefficient alpha, you maybe should 
you know, step back a little bit, calm yourself down, have a beverage, whatever. <clears throat> Another mistake, and this is maybe a little bit of a fussy one, is that the values for coefficient alpha range between zero and one. Um, it's technically true that negative values for coefficient alpha can happen, although to be fair they usually indicate some sort of a problem, like if you te uh, forgot to recode reversed items. So if you have a test which measures things and all the endorsements of item go in one direction, so people are answering true or saying yes, and, and doing so increases their score on whatever the scale is that's being measured. Um, you sometimes reverse items, so uh, you know, to, to discourage people from you know, being careless and responding, and make sure they're reading correctly. You have reverse scored items. If you forget to re-reverse them when you actually do the calculation at the end, um, you sometimes see weird values of coefficient alpha, including negative values. So just something to something to keep in mind. I've certainly seen that myself. Um, anyway, coefficient alpha um, technically is a sort of a, a I know I'm using coefficient alpha and Chromebooks alpha interchangeably. There's a, a calculation for coefficient alpha that's kind of a very general version of that previous formula I showed you. Um, and then there's another calculation which you sometimes see called KR20, which is similar. And I'm putting it up here um, to, just to show you the formula and illustrate that it's fairly similar to the one you saw before, not to suggest that you need to memorize this. KR20, like coefficient alpha, like Chromebooks alpha, is just a way of talking about uh, internal consistency. It's one though that is more appropriate for uh, situations where you have binary test items, you know, true, false, yes, no. Um, coefficient alpha works better when you have uh, items which can be responded to um, across a range. Okay, so I, I haven't really, I guess I introduced a bunch of myths about coefficient alpha, so I've sort of trashed that a little bit. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about reliability as rater agreement. Uh, here I'm talking about inter-rater reliability, and that's something you've probably heard before, especially if you've taken like an educational or developmental site class where you've talked about rating scales that might be used in a classroom or something like that. Um, kappa is a calculation of one of these is one of the ways you can look at inter-rater reliability and basically what you're trying to do is look at the extent to which raters agree with one another. So you could imagine if, if two raters they're using the same checklist or same questionnaire and they're evaluating the same group of children or whatever um, we would expect that they would arrive at very similar uh, impressions or ratings or scores of those children or of those subjects whatever. Um, to the extent that they do, to the extent that they are consistent, we might think, aha, this instrument, this rating scale, this questionnaire is quite reliable. And certainly the opposite, you know, if they were very inconsistent with each other, we might really question either the raters, although let's assume that they're well trained and they're doing their best, or the rating scale they're using. We might worry about the reliability of that rating scale. So the extent to which raters agree, of course it's going to depend a lot on the nature of the ratings, uh, what we're doing, but briefly speaking, this idea is more consistency is, is better. It more, indicates more reliability, less consistency, less reliability. And like I said before, Kappa, uh, developed by um, uh, uh, Lee Cohen, Lee Cohen? Oh gosh, that's, I'm pretty sure it is. Anyway, Cohen as in Cohen, the famous statistician Cohen. <laughs> Um, uh, one of his many contributions, even though I can't remember his first name, is a calculation you can make when you have uh, two raters and you have binary ratings. So um, you just simply look at their level of observed agreement and then you make a calculation for what we'd expect to be their chance level of agreement and using that calculation you can arrive at a final, um, a final calculation of kappa. So let's look at a, a little example here. Let's say we've got two raters that are using some sort of a, a checklist or a rating scale to, let's say, diagnose the presence of schizophrenia in a group of people. You know, they're, look, they're on a hospital ward and they're double checking the records and the diagnoses. And so they're going through looking at a group of patients and each rater using the same questionnaire or same checklist is arriving at a yes, no. You know, like, yes, they have, a schizophrenia, no they don't have schizophrenia, kind of a determination. Um, you could look at their observed agreement, 
You can see clearly the instances in which they're say both saying yes or they're both saying no as a fraction of the total number of ratings. In this case, their observed agreement is 70%. Of course, the interesting thing is to ask, well, what's their chance agreement? What would we expect them to, how much would we expect them to agree, to agree if they were entirely randomly and haphazardly doing each of their ratings? Now, it's actually not that hard to calculate the probability of chance agreement or the proportion of chance agreement. I, I know this looks fussy, but it really isn't. Um, the first thing we would do is we could observe the proportion of times that rater A says yes. So if you just look across uh, the uh, uh, across the columns for yes for rater A, he or she is saying yes 25 out of 50 times. Um, so that's going to be 50% you know, of course. And we do the same thing with uh, rater B and I'll see here right now in my PowerPoint it's irritating me that there's a slight typo. So Raider B says yes 30 out of 50, per, uh, 50 times, so that's 60%. And then we just look at the conjunction of those two probabilities, the probability that both A says yes and B says yes by multiplying them together, and that's 0.30 or 30%. And we do the same thing with no's. We calculate the probability uh, conjunct the sort of conjunction of the probabilities for rater A saying no and rater B saying no, and that's 20% of the time. And then we just add them, you know, the probability of chance agreement, the chance that they're both saying yes at the same time or they're both saying no at the same time by chance, and that's 0 0.50, just by adding 0 0.30 or 30% to 0.20 or 20%. So. It may seem a little fussy, but it's actually not even with my typo in there if you just kind of think about it. And then we just do the math. We say that what's our uh, observed proportion of agreement, what's our, ex the E is for expected, like as in expected by chance, what's our chance level of agreement, and then we divide by 1 minus our chance level of agreement, and it's 0 0.40. And we say, aha, Cohen's kappa, 0 0.40. Well, what does that mean? Well, there are some guidelines for interpreting Cohen's kappa. Um, I've put them here on the screen. Uh, these are arbitrary. I, you know, different textbooks will report slightly different values. You can probably hunt around the internet for quite a while. There is research, some of research uh, on, you know, on certainly on Cohen's kappa, but they're not really sort of well-established cutoffs for what, you know, necessarily is a small amount of agreement what is necessarily a high amount of agreement. The, word, the thing to note here, of course, is that the values range from zero to one, and as they get higher or closer to one, they're reflecting or indicating a greater level of agreement uh, between our two raters. Okay, so again, not that hard to do. Like you could totally do those calculations on a piece of paper if you had the formula and if you could make a table for yourself. Now there are some issues with uh, Cohen's kappa that are worth keeping in mind. One is you sometimes get situations of seemingly inconsistent findings. So here's a situation, uh, or two situations, or two scenarios, uh, each of which involve 100 ratings between our two raters A and B. And in both cases, the raters have an observed uh, you know, level of agreement of 0.6. So uh, the proportion of times they're agreeing is 0.6 in both cases. Um, however, the calculations of Cohen's, L, or, uh, uh, Cohen's kappa come out slightly differently. And the reason that is the case, even though we sort of have a situation in which, you know, uh, they're, uh, you know, that looks very similar, is because of the relative proportions of times that the raters are not agreeing with one another. So um, the, the point is, you can get situations in which it sort of seems as if the raters are having the same level of agreement, but they have different levels of calculated Cohen's kappa. And that's just because Cohen's kappa obliges us to think about situations in which the raters are not agreeing with one another. And clearly that's important. You know, it's, it's easy to say like, well, you know, these doctors all agree with each other 60% of the time. Well, what about the situations in which they're not agreeing with one another? Other issues with Cohen's kappa, um, the prevalence of rating codes will affect uh, how ca or the ca final calculation of kappa. So if there are lots of yeses 
or lots and lots of no's if most of the time like you could imagine if you're if you are um, having raiders look at something which very rarely occurs so you're let's say you're having um, raiders use a particular rating scale to evaluate people for suicide risk but of course and thankfully most of the time people are not uh, at imminent risk of suicide so there are lots and lots and lots of no's where you know both raiders are saying no or maybe you're having raiders rate children for levels of like you know uh, uh, expressed emotion and kids are mostly pretty emotional and, and expressive and so lots and lots of the times both people are saying yes both readers are saying yes then that will tend to drive up Cohen's Kappa um, another thing is uh, reader bias if both raiders have very similar probabilities of saying yes and no like if one raider just most of the time on this rating scale is saying yes and if the other person most of the time is also saying yes that's going to tend to drive up uh, Kappa in a way that's going to make it look like the Raiders are agreeing a lot and in a sense of course they are but it's because maybe you've got a Raider which uh, you know who just tends to always say yes you know he is a yay saying type of Raider or, or or the opposite a nay saying type of Raider um, this idea of Raider bias I, I'm tacking on here and I hope it doesn't seem too confusing um, the point maybe to extract from it is if you were trying to evaluate inter-rater reliability using Cohen's Kappa uh, with let's say behavioral checklists for children or suicide risk checklists for patients or whatever you'd want to spend a lot of time training your raters to make sure they weren't uh, just kind of using some sort of odd or idiosyncratic bias in their rating and just uh, I tend to say yes I tend to say yes well that's not good at least not good from the perspective of evaluating the reliability of the instrument the test that you're using a couple more things about Cohen's Kappa um, if there are uh, as there are more codes um, one the calculations get harder to do as you can imagine uh, also um, Kappa tends to go up so if instead of having like yes no or present absent you had like yes no maybe um, you have three codes that each reader can assign to each you know participant or each test uh, subject then that will tend to drive Kappa up it also as I said makes the calculations a little bit tricky um, there is a calculation that can um, that we can use for uh, situations in which we have more than two raters um, so uh, you know let's say instead of just having Raider A and Raider B you have Raider A Raider B and Raider C and now uh, I mean you could sort of imagine like a three-dimensional uh, grid in which you're plotting agreements and disagreements but even without dwelling too much upon that you can imagine the math gets harder there's a different calculation called Fleiss's Kappa which I'm not even bothering to include here because it is at least in my judgment fairly tricky I'm just noting it right now because yeah there's another way there are ways to do inter-rater reliability if you have more than than one uh, rater so inter-rater reliability so far we've been thinking about situations for the most part in which the rating that's given is like a binary rating yes no present absent you know diagnosed not diagnosed uh, you know etc um, of course often with rating scales you might give some sort of a numeric rating that is fairly continuous like you know someone's level of uh, you know I'm scoring up uh, each uh, patient on their level of depression using a checklist that's giving me values that go from 0 to 10 and, and the other rater is doing the same and we're going through a group of patients together in that situation of course it's a lot easier to talk about our reliability with one another our inter-rater reliability because we can just do the simple correlation between rater A or and rater B and there's a slight typo here because I put correlation 1 comma 2 what I really should have done is correlation a comma b but you get the idea if you think back to maybe a basic stats class you know that, uh, you've taken you know that there are other ways of doing um, correlations if you have ranks so instead of uh, giving people ratings on a continuous scale maybe I'm ranking people like I'm going through a, 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 a ward at a psychiatric hospital I'm ranking people on their level of uh, you know sort of symptom presentation and, and the other rater is doing the same and we're using some sort of a, t a checklist or a, a rating system to determine these rankings um, we can look at our Spearman's row or our Kendall's tau correlation which would basically give us the same sort of thing uh, an estimate of our agreement with one another
And that agreement, of course, tells us something about the reliability of the instrument that we're using, the rating scale, the ranking scale, whatever. You know, some assumptions and issues that go along with correlations. Um, you know, we're talking about pairs of ratings for single targets. Um, you know whether they are uh, in, you know individual patients or 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 clients or or whatever. When in most of these cases, we're using the sort of regular Pearson correlation. We could have situations though where we're looking at uh, a rating done by one or more raters on pairs of targets. So instead of just having groups of people, we now have pairs of people. Like they could be twins. You know, I'm rating the level of symptom presentation on a group of monozygotic twins to do some sort of behavioral genetics type analysis uh, of, you know, alcoholism or depression. Or I could be looking at uh, couples uh, and they could be sort of their level of relationship satisfaction rated for each uh, member of a couple. In these cases, there's a whole group of calculations that we can do called intra-class correlations or ICCs, um, which I'll briefly talk about here, but suffice it to say they're fairly complicated to do. Um, the reason why we do them is we can have situations in which we have one or more than one rater, um, and we can also have situations in which we have groups of targets that have some sort of necessary relationship to each other. And in some cases that necessary relationship is fairly well defined, like we could have heterosexual couples and so we have all the, you know, sort of husbands or, you know, boyfriends in one column of our spreadsheet and all the wives or girlfriends in another column. And we have maybe one raider or two raiders assigning each of them some sort of a score. And then we can look at the relationship between ratings for couple one, couple two, couple three, couple four as a way of evaluating the reliability of our rating scale. Um, or we could have couples or, or you know, pairs which don't have that type of obvious defined relationship. So we might have same-sex couples or we might have twins who are same-sex twins. So it's not obvious which person goes in which column. And you could imagine just in your mind a column of values for each uh, you know, member, you know, one column for one member of the pair, one column for another mem the other members of the pair. But if there's not a defined relationship like as in by gender, you could sort of swap back and forth people into different combinations and you would get slightly different correlations between the values in those columns. Interclass correlation coefficients are a way of kind of getting around that and like I said, they're, they're fairly complicated, but a simplistic way of thinking about them is they work a little bit like factorial ANOVA if you've taken a stats class where we try to um, do, you know, sort of quantify the effect related to the target and the effect related to the rater. So how much of a, um, of an, a relationship there is having to do with the raters and how much has to do with the just variability across the targets. You know, not every couple has the same level of relationship satisfaction. Um, but to the extent that our raters doing the rating are using the scale and the scale is consistent, we should see a fairly high effect from Raider, and that's a way we could evaluate the reliability of a rating system uh, using inter-Raider reliability, but particularly inter-class correlation coefficients. Okay, so if you've made it so far, you, you may be thinking, gosh, there's a lot of different ways to calculate uh, estimates of reliability. Some of them are fairly straightforward. Some of them are quite complicated and even, you know, I have done maybe not as good a job as I could in terms of describing all the details of how to do them. Um, if you're getting a little confused, don't worry because it's really not quite that complicated. There are these different types of reliability coefficients and in one way or the other they're all telling us something about consistency. Consistency over different forms of a test, consistency over time, consistency over different portions or subsections of a test, or consistency between raters. And in each case we can use that information to do something which is kind of important to us, which is to think about where the true score for any individual person lies. If you think back to the last lecture, you know I said that you can't 
know precisely where a given test taker's true score lies, you know, where a person's true level of depression is or their true level of intelligence is. But what you can do is use information about the reliability of the test that you use to measure whatever it is you just measured to estimate where a range in which uh, where that uh, person's true score lies. So the idea, and I, I mentioned this in the last lecture, is if we could somehow test and test and test the same person repeatedly, like each time not literally testing them again like test retest reliability, but somehow rewinding the clock of the universe and testing them again and somehow recording the score and testing them again and recording the score and testing them again and recording the score, we'd get a sampling distribution of values which we could describe in terms of the standard error of measurement standard which is just the standard deviation of this sampling distribution. Now of course we can't rewind the clock of the universe a very large number of times or, or even once. Although as a sidebar on Netflix last night I totally watched a sci-fi movie that was more or less about doing this minus the psychological testing. Um, but we can estimate what this standard error of measurement would be. And the way we estimate it is we use the standard deviation of our test and the reliability of our test. So we can use this calculation here. And the, the gist of it is, as reliability gets bigger, the standard error of measurement gets smaller. That probably makes a certain intuitive sense to you. If I'm testing someone with a very reliable measure, I would expect or anticipate that if I could somehow repeatedly test them a very large number of times, the values that I got would be very similar they would be very consistent because my measurement is very reliable. However, if I was testing someone using a uh, very unreliable uh, test, a test I knew to be or suspected to be quite unreliable, I might anticipate that if I was to somehow magically retest them again and again, those scores would be quite varied from one another. So the, the point here, the, you know, the, the kind of the interesting take home is that all these calculations of reliability allow us to, among their other things, I mean, they're kind of interesting on their own, but they allow us to talk about the standard error of measurement, which can be really useful to us. Because once we have the standard error of measurement, we can apply it to our way of thinking about distributions of scores and estimate a range let's say a 95% confidence interval in which we expect a given value to lie. So if you think back to like doing the 95% confidence interval around a mean, you probably remember calculations like this. Again, you might take a score and multiply it by the uh, standard deviation of the distribution times 1.9, or I'm sorry, the standard error of the distribution uh, times 1.96. Here what we're going to do is take an individual person's score and add it to the standard error of measurement times 1.96 or subtract that value from their measurement to get the 95% confidence interval around a particular uh, score. This range from the top of the confidence interval to the bottom of the confidence interval is called the margin of error. And it's just a range in which we expect the true score to lie. Or maybe more accurately put, it's a, it's a range in which we expect, were we to repeatedly do these cycles of testing, that range would capture the true score. And we could, of course, represent it graphically with error bars to represent this margin of error. And you look at uh, scores, uh, um, you know, tests like there's a printout for a uh, Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, I believe it is, and you can see a range of values around um, our true person, our the person's scale score for these different uh, different uh, uh, scales. So we can add, we can ask where is the person's true score for uh, this, you know, uh, verbal composite or performance composite, and so on. We can also look to see if there's dis significant discrepancies between two scores. So if we have a score on a measure of ability and maybe a score on a measure of uh, 
of achievement or a score on the measure of verbal intelligence and a score on the measure of performance intelligence, it's tempting to interpret differences as uh, important or maybe even significant, but using confidence intervals we can calculate whether there is a, in fact, significant difference between two scores. So we can calculate the standard error of measurement for the difference, which is not as difficult as it looks. It's just the standard error of measurement for score 1 squared plus standard error of measurement for score 2 squared, square rooted, and then applied to that same confidence interval formula that we saw before. And if that confidence interval for the difference overlaps with 0, then we might reasonably conclude that there is not a significant difference between those two scores. You know, it may appear that the person's verbal IQ is higher than their performance IQ, but it's not a significant difference, at least using the kind of conventional 0.05 alpha for null hypothesis significance testing. Or if we were doing uh, a test for, let's say, a learning disability, and we found that the person, a student's achievement score um, was quite a bit lower than their ability score. You know, they didn't seem to be you know, performing or achieving up to their level of ability, and we did a calculation for the difference, we found that the confidence interval for the difference did not overlap with zero, we might say, aha, there's a significantly, uh, their performance uh, on the achievement test is significantly lower than their performance on the ability test, and maybe, depending on the nature of the testing, we might say this is indicative of a learning disability, or is at least, you know, merits further evaluation, or so on. Hopefully this kind of makes sense to you. I, I know I'm going a little bit quickly because I can see this lecture is, is dragging on a bit. Um, and I'm trusting that all of you have encountered confidence intervals before. The real innovation here or in this lecture is just to note that you can calculate confidence intervals for individual test scores, which is something that's super interesting and useful to do. And you can do it by way of the standard error of measurement, which you can estimate with reliability. Um, however, you may be thinking, wait a sec, there are different kinds of reliability coefficients. Does that mean there are different confidence intervals? Yes. <laughs> Measurement error, reliability, and confidence are not fixed values. They depend on the context. So yeah, you could use split half reliability estimate of rely uh, split half estimate of reliability, alternate forms estimate of reliability, uh, coefficient alpha estimate of reliability, and they would all give you slightly different calculations for confidence intervals. So which one's the right one? It depends a lot on what you're measuring and how you're choosing to measure it. And that's why, as I've said a bunch of times in this lecture, context, application, they're so important. You have to kind of think about that stuff instead of sort of mindlessly grinding ahead with your calculations. Well, speaking of mindlessly grinding ahead, we don't have to do any more of that right now. We're done. Uh, as a preview for next week, I'm going to be talking about ways to think about validity, um, which in some ways is a lot more complicated than reliability. Uh, it's much more conceptual. There's less calculation and estimation of uh, validity. Um, but of course, it's very important. So uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. In between now and then, just take a moment, relax, maybe have a cup of coffee, have a snack, and hopefully some of this information will sink in and make sense to you. If it doesn't, ask me about it in class. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.